The roots of the conflict, there's so many different dimensions to this if you go throughout history. So I think there is a, there is a, a as, as in every, any, anything to do with international relations, there is a power dimension to it. It's about control and influence. And so Qatar was always somewhat a vassal state of the Saudis in, throughout history. In, in the same way that Bahrain is a vassal state to Saudi Arabia today. And the big brother of all the GCC countries was always the Saudis. And the Saudis had disproportionate influence over all these smaller countries. And I think over, since the 1990s, we've seen a hyper development, in, 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 particularly in the UAE and Qatar, where both of the, Abu Dhabi and Doha wanted to emancipate themselves from the influence of Saudi Arabia because they thought Saudi influence is in many ways uh, counterproductive to development. And as part of this, the Saudis were fearful to lose control. And we also have to say that Qatari society in Qatar as a country was always a lot closer to the Saudis than the Emiratis were. So losing Qatar was for something that the Saudis could not accept. And we've seen there have been a lot of different incidents where the Saudis have tried to meddle in internal affairs in Qatar, trying to change the regimes, putting pressure on emirs. Um, and I think this is part of, it's an extension of that as well. It's about we want to control Qatar. The Emiratis want to control Qatar in a way of making Qatar silent. They can't, they don't want Qatar to continuously funding opposition groups across the region. They don't want Qatar to, to pour money into media outlets that provide liberal uh, um, ideology across the region because liberal ideology will lead for them to insurgency and revolution and instability. Um, then there is another dimension to it, is the ideological one that somewhat links into the, uh, the, the, um, the one over interests. The ideological one is really the Emirati-Saudi idea of authoritarian stability. The only way that the Middle East can excel is by having clear, repressive, authoritarian regimes that have an iron fist and can control their people through a very strong security sector. Um, in the same way, basically following the narrative that was, um, that was uh, propagated by the West throughout you know, all the way until the, the Arab Spring. We always believed it's best for the Middle East to have a strong uh, authoritarian regime in the middle, at the center of each state that can control the people, because um, this way we can create some sort of certainty. Well, one year ago, when we heard that um, there was a blockade in place, cutting off the peninsula of Qatar from its neighbors, I thought that this crisis would really impact the, 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 the social, political and economic um, dimension of Qatar in many ways, because Qatar was so dependent and reliant on its neighboring countries. But considering where we were a year ago and where Qatar is today, I think Qatar was very, very strong in weathering the crisis. They, of course, they invested billions and billions of dollars into alleviating the impact of that crisis on the economy. Um, but they did it quite well in a way. So we had a positive economic growth rates by 2.6%. Um, the country internally, so if you look at the social dimension, the countries are now more lenient and more loyal to the Emir than they've ever been. There's a lot of rallying around the flag. So while the blockading countries were aiming to somewhat divide Qatari society and especially divide society from the leadership, I think now we've seen a lot of rallying around the flag in a way that the countries are supportive of their leadership in a way that they've never been in throughout history. If you look at the economy, the countries have now completely changed um, the, you know, the, the labor laws internally. They have um, created a better environment for, to do business. They're attracting foreign investments, attracting foreign companies to do business in Qatar in a way that they haven't done before. Because Qatar was always somewhat negligent when it comes to reforming. Qatar is a very rich country that never really thought s sincerely about the post-hydrocarbon era or the post-gas uh, era. And now this opportunity, this, the crisis has created an opportunity where they changed all these laws, attracting companies to come into the country and in many ways um, help the economy to rise again and produce much of the stuff that was used to be imported from other countries, Bahrain, from Saudi or from the UAE, is now produced locally or imported from other sources. In the political, international political domain, uh, the countries were able to weather the crisis quite um, well as well. If you consider um, that this whole crisis was aimed at telling the West a story about Qatar funding terrorism, um, instead of cutting Qatar off, from the West, it actually, I would say, in many ways brought Qatar a lot closer to the West. And today, I think that Qatar, from all the six GCC countries, 
has, is closer to Europe and is closer to Washington than the other GCC countries because also because the countries have said whatever you want us to do we're willing to do it. If you want us to change our labor laws we will do this. If you want us to um, you know to uh, to uh, provide more civil liberties to our people we're willing to do this. So there's been a massive reform effort within Qatar um, that the West has positively responded to. The countries have also said, you know, if you want to have control over our finances when it comes to financing uh, terrorism or financing other radical groups in the region, we're opening our books and we give you open access to all the different sources um, of our finances plus the destinations of where the money is going so that you cannot come and tell us, um, you know, we're, we're continuously uh, funding terrorism because it's not true. So the countries in many ways have given up on their sovereignty in this respect. They have provided the Americans in particular with a memorandum of understanding that provides the Americans full access to all the books of the country. So all the, the, the assets that are in Qatar plus where all the assets are going overseas. And this kind of control provides provided reassurance to international partners that the countries are actually no longer funding non-state actors in the, in the region. Big debate in international relations, what is influence? Um, you know, there's hard and there's soft power in many ways. So if we look at the hard power, um, and that is for me military and economics, I think the three most important countries in the Gulf are Saudi Arabia, UAE and Qatar. And they have been since at least the Arab Spring. Saudi Arabia has a lot of leverage just by the size of the, the country, 32 million in, inhabitants. Despite their economic crises and their financial problems that they have internally, they still have a lot of financial um, 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 assets that they can spend. So there is a lot of economic power there. They have a huge military as well, the Saudis. The problem with their military, however, is that it is not fit for purpose. It's not fit to actually neither to provide defense for the country nor provide an expeditionary capability. Again, I think that is, that is very important um, to understand. So if you look at the pure numbers, Saudi Arabia has a big military, but they can't use this military. We see this in Yemen, which is a relatively small conflict. And even there, the Saudis are bogged down in a, in a crisis that they can't get out of on their own. So militarily, they have problems in, 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 in different uh, forces integration, so integrating the Air Force with the ground forces, coordinating efforts, coordinating um, uh, military operations is something that the Saudis are very bad at. Um, in terms of communication, you know, there are a lot of flaws, and this Yemen crisis, this Yemen war has somewhat brought this to the forefront. Um, that's why they've asked the Emiratis to help them out. There was always, from the beginning, it was clear to the Saudis that they couldn't do anything in Yemen without the support of the UAE. Now the UAE is a relatively small country and they're very much punching above their weight. But the Emiratis have probably been the biggest, not the biggest, but the most effective military um, in the region. I would say that after the Israeli military, the UAE military is probably the most effective one in, in, in this part of the world, but by, by in terms of size and impact. The problem here now is that the Emiratis have used this, overused their military strength across the region. So they are now in Libya, they're in, uh, they're in Yemen, they're in the Horn of Africa and Somalia. Um, and, and in other countries around, <clears throat> and even in Sudan and Djibouti. So in terms of size, the capacity of the UAE military is not big enough to actually allow them to do all this. So what they do is they rely on local proxies and surrogates, of which they sometimes of, they lose control, as they do in Yemen, um, which then provides other problems. So the UAE military is good, but they're punching way above their, their weight in terms of the size of the country. Um, but if it came to a military conflict over Qatar, the UAE would have the capacity and the capability to go in and, in and take the Emir out. That was, that was the plan initially. The Qatari military is in a, in a, in a process of restructuring. Um, for many years they were, they've been neglected and only over the last five years the Qatari's really massively invested into the capability of their military. So, and, but the capability of a military is not just about buying uh, tanks and buying platforms, but it's also investing into the capacity of the people, investing into the education of the people in the military. And that's what the countries are doing now. I'd say they're still lagging behind the UAE in many ways, but you know, they, they, they're, they're able to, to fill that gap increasingly. Um, but anyway, it's, it's not so much about military power. If you look at the UAE and Qatar, their biggest asset, I would say, is uh, soft power.
We shouldn't forget that the Middle East, the, the center of gravity of the Middle East has shifted away from Egypt, Syria and Iraq. These were the used, used to be the big old powerhouses in the Middle East of, over the 20th century. Now the new powerhouses are all in the Gulf. So a crisis in the Gulf will inevitably have ripple effects across the region and that's what we've seen. The current crisis of 2017, I would say, really dates back at least to 2011, maybe even further. But let's say it dates back to the Arab Spring. And we've seen some of these crises between different ideologies, between the ideology of the UAE, which believes in authoritarian stability, versus the ideology of the Qataris, which is more about enabling people for change and supporting revolutionaries. These two ideologies have clashed already in Libya in 2011, and they continue to clash there. They have clashed in Egypt and since 2012, 13 in particular, when there was the coup uh, by the Egyptian military. So whatever happens in the Gulf will have ripple effects. And these ripple effects are now felt across the region, because even in Syria and even in Iraq, even in Jordan, people now are being presented with a choice, whereby the blockading countries, most importantly Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, provide partners with a choice. They say, if you want our funding, you have to abide by our rules and by our ideology. And um, we see this in the Horn of Africa even at the moment, where the Qataris are investing, the Emiratis are investing, and they're trying to pull all these different countries in and all these different groups in by, by basically you know, selling their narrative in a way. So in, in many ways, there's the ripple effects for the region has been very negative because people you know, it's, it is already a polarized region as it is. And if now in this polarized environment, people now have to make even more choices, whether it's black and white, and reality in the Middle East has never been black and white, but trying to make it black and white will actually exacerbate this polarization even further, create more division within these countries. And that's something that goes beyond the, the GCC and goes beyond the Gulf. I think we've realized, at least then after December, that the Kuwaiti mediation effort was somewhat dead. Not because the Kuwaitis weren't doing enough, I think the Kuwaitis really went out of their way to try to find a solution to this, but it's unique, for mediation you need to have partners um, who are willing to talk. And I think the Qataris have made it clear from the beginning that they want a diplomatic solution to this and they're willing to talk as long as it doesn't touch upon their sovereignty. The UAE and Saudi Arabia, however, have said we don't need to talk, I mean we can live with the status quo. And so I think the real change now would be what can Donald Trump do? Donald Trump has um, promised the Emir of Qatar that he would personally over, uh, um, you know, make an effort in seeing the end of this crisis and trying to put pressure on all these parties to come together. What the Trump administration has done, they have selected the Omanis as a, as a go-to guy, as an intermediary. So while all these GCC countries don't have ambassadors in Doha at the moment, um, Oman does. So Oman is at the moment representing the UAE, uh, sorry, not the UAE, Saudi and Bahrain, and, and as an indirect channel of communication between Doha and, these, and, and Saudi and Bahrain. Um, Greece, I think, is, um, is, is representing the Egyptians. Just the UAE are the one country that is not being represented. The UAE have, in many ways, um, disrespected also the Trump administration. So after several phone calls by Donald Trump to, with Mohammed bin Zayed and, and, and other dignitaries in Abu Dhabi, um, the Emiratis have told them we're not interested in a, in, in a mediation, this is an internal matter and we don't want the Americans to play a role in this. Um, and equally they didn't make any effort to say we, we're trying to solve this, they said we, we want to continue this. And I think this sort of disrespect didn't go down well in Washington. As you might recall, Mohammed bin Zayed was supposed to come to the White House in May this year, um, but never showed up. So the Emiratis said, oh and Mohammed bin Zayed didn't want to go, um, I heard it from Washington, from uh, some uh, friends who worked within the Trump administration, they were telling me they actually didn't want Mohammed bin Zayed to come because of the disrespect that he paid to Donald Trump. Because he said, you know, Donald Trump wants you guys to sit down and the UAE said, no, we don't want to. And that somewhat shows you the kind of um, changing um, power relations between Washington and the Gulf. The Gulf countries have become, all of them, increasingly powerful. They're no longer just uh, the little uh, puppets of the US. There are, in many ways, relationships on par, on, on, on equal level. And the UAE have a lot of confidence. They have a very strong military, they have a strong economy, they have international relations that don't require the United States necessarily, and, when it, and they're very ideological. 
So their fear, their paranoia about terrorism and their paranoia about Iran, in Abu Dhabi in particular, um, so tells them that you know, we will not compromise. They've compromised in 2014 during the last Gulf crisis and for them, in their point of view, nothing has changed. So now I think they, they, they say we are unwilling to negotiate and we are unwilling to mediate. Um, so I think a, a way out of this kind of stalemate at the moment is concentrating on Saudi Arabia. I think Saudi Arabia has a lot more to lose from this crisis than, than the other countries. Um, I'm not talking about Bahrain the whole time. Um, the reason I, is, is that, you know, the, the, the Bahrainis have not had their own foreign and security policy over the last couple of years. So they will follow the Saudi model. Whatever the Saudis suggest, the Bahrainis will follow. Um, and, and, and that's why nobody concentrates on the Bahrainis. The Bahrainis actually, from interpersonal relationships, I think the Bahraini government, surprisingly, is not 100% behind this crisis. Um, in many ways, you know, they, are, they still have good rapport and relationship with the, the, the leaderships of the Al Khalifas and the Al Thanis in Qatar. So there is still some sort of, um, there, there have been uh, interactions in the past. Um, so the concentration, the focus should be now on Saudi Arabia. Because if you get Saudi Arabia to change and change their position and make a concession towards Qatar, um, Bahrain will follow, possibly Egypt will follow. Because Bahrain and Egypt are bankrupt countries that do require financial bailouts from Saudi Arabia so if so, or the Emirates. But if Saudi Arabia was going, making one move into, the, into one direction, the Bahrainis and the Egyptians would have to follow in one way or the other. Plus, the Saudis are under a lot of financial pressure. They need to reform. They have huge government debt um, accumulating every year. All the efforts that Mohammed bin Salman was trying, the NEOM and uh, attracting foreign direct investment were initiatives that for now have been very unsuccessful. If you look at the foreign direct investments that came into Saudi Arabia last year that were at a 10 year low. Um, so the economic, they, they need Qatar as a partner. Qatar could potentially invest in Saudi and help the Saudis bring up their economy. And I think the Saudis also need the support of Donald Trump. They can't afford losing Donald Trump in the same way that the UAE might be able to afford losing Donald Trump. And that's why I think that the, the entire focus of, of diplomacy and mediation should be now on, on, on the Saudis. The Emiratis, I think, will be the biggest, uh, the toughest nut to crack. I think for the time being, there is no, no sense of trying to, to even realize that the crisis is counterproductive. The, the Emiratis can sustain this indefinitely. They can sustain the cost of the crisis indefinitely and also the damage that's been done on, on local businesses indefinitely. In a way that also the Qataris can. Both Qatar and the UAE are the wealthiest country in the region. They have a lot of surplus that they can invest into, into somewhat de um, dealing with the, the, the negative impact of the crisis. But Saudi, Bahrain, they cannot, they cannot afford this kind of crisis.